When I was thinking about this lesson, I remember there was a time that I used to like to watch a lot of these survivor shows on television where they drop somebody off in the middle of nowhere and they tried to make it back to civilization using very little of what they had and making it back to civilization or to a certain point in which they were to make it to. And I always was very interested in those things. I'm sure I would never do very good if that was me. But I found it interesting to watch them and the things which they did and the, sometimes the crazy things they tried to overcome whatever obstacle was before them. You know, as a Christian, there are many things in life that come our way. And in many ways, you might say we too are trying to survive the onslaught of things that are going on in this world today. I want you to think about for a moment a Christian survivor series, so to speak. What would it look like? What things would you have to endure? In a television show, many times it could be include climbing down a mountain or climbing over a small one, crossing a river or going through a cold Arctic area. But in the spiritual sense, what obstacles do we have to conquer as a Christian? One of the first things we have to conquer, one of the first things we have to deal with in this life, and it's very clear today, it becomes more clear each and every day, is how to handle, if you will, how to handle uh, government leadership. You think about this in Daniel chapter 3 with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel 6, like we saw this morning with Daniel the lion's den, he was placed, those men were placed in those situations because of the various laws and decrees made by their government, which they were under. The Christian has a duty to government and must be dedicated to the, to, uh, the, to God. We know, for instance, in Acts chapter 4, verse 19, Paul, or Peter the rather, says there, if it's good to serve God, judge for yourselves, basically, is what he tells us there in Acts 4 and verse 19. But we think about this this morning, and I'll get to the, the verse I'm looking at here. Acts 4 verse 19, there we go. See, we do things a different way than we had before. You've got to remember how it's supposed to work. Acts 4, 19 says, But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God, you judge. That either being you decide if it's good for you to, to obey God or to obey the laws of the land. We know that as a Christian we have to be dedicated to God. Yes, we have to follow the laws of the land. But like Brother Glenn pointed out this morning, like we have talked about many times before, when the laws of the land contradict the laws of God, which way do we go? We go to the laws of God. We think about this, earthly government, despite its many attempts, cannot change right to wrong or wrong to right. Think about this for a moment, if you will, from Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9. When you think about the ways of God compared to the ways of man, here the Lord speaks and says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. I think about growing up as a child, as a teenager, and wanting to do things my own way. My parents tell me, no, that's not the way you're going to do it. We have a certain way we want to do this, and that's how you're going to do it. If we disagreed as a child, it didn't matter. We still had to do it, didn't we? But because today, as, especially as adults, we have free will, and so even though God may tell us something we, we ought to be doing or how we ought to do things, we can still choose to do otherwise, can't we? Look again at Isaiah 55, this time looking at verses 8 and 9. He says, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God is reminding us that His way is the better way. In reality, His way is the only way, isn't it? Every time man has sought to do things their own way and it be contrary to God, what has happened? Man has faltered. You pick any nation out of the world who does things contrary to God, and what do you find? A nation that in many ways is just a mess, isn't it? 
because they're holding to sin, refusing to do things God's way. Notice there also in verse 8 and 9, when he says, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. God's ways aren't just a little bit higher than ours. Notice the comparison he gives. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. God's way is supreme, isn't it? We think about the wisdom of God, the power of God, the infinite knowledge of God. Doesn't it make sense that His ways are so much higher than our ways? Government is ran by man with free will. Thus, government will, at least at times, be contrary to God. Is every law of the land contrary to God? No. Are there some that are contrary to God? Absolutely. Some that make you think, who wrote up this idea? This law. We think about this today. This is one of the things that a Christian has to deal with is government leadership. What are we to do? Well, we go back, we find that Peter tells us also in the book of Acts that we are to obey God rather than men. But we know that government likes to push it down our throats and certain things are okay, certain things are acceptable. I don't have to tell you what they are. You know what I'm talking about. We've talked about it many times before. Turn on the news, you'll see what we're talking about. But those things are acceptable. And anything spoken against them is just hateful speech from those who are just, to be honest, many times who they claim to just to be ignorant. But we know if we are sticking to the Bible, we're trying to call people to a higher plane of living, aren't we? Isn't that what God is trying to get us to do, to bring us to a higher plane? When he says there in Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9, he says, My ways are higher than your ways. He says, As the heavens are higher than the earth. If your ways are God's ways, then we are on that higher plane of living, aren't we? Now, the world doesn't view it that way, but that's how God tells us. If we're doing things His way, then we are above doing things the wicked ways of the earth. What's something else that a Christian has to deal with? We know Christian leadership or government leadership we could talk about for days. But what else does a Christian have to deal with? What about pressures from the world? Now, I did that very generic because how many pressures are there from the world? Well, we, again, we could be here for quite a while. But I want you to think for a moment. The world says, for instance, that God does not exist. Think for a moment. Look at, if you will, with me, Psalm 14, verse 1. The Bible says, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. Now you think about this for a moment. He says, The fool has said in his heart, Who is speaking? Well, God. The Bible also tells us, in the book of Hebrews, the sense of the beginning of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen in what? In the things around us. And God speaking, being God, of course, some will dismiss this. But he says, those who say there is no God, he says there's a fool. They are a fool. Because look around us. We cannot know everything about God from nature. But nature does tell us one thing. God does exist. Not only does he exist, there must be a God. And the God of the Bible tells us as we search through the scriptures and compare to these, to these false gods of the world that He is the only God. In fact, we find that very idea as we look at Isaiah chapter 44 verses 6 through 8. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. He says, I notice I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. You think about this for a moment. We'll get to it in just a second. Has God ever challenged man to show that their little God exists? Absolutely. Because the God of the Bible has nothing to fear, does He? As He says here in verse 6, Besides me, there is no God. 
In verse 7, and who can proclaim as I do? Who can speak as He speaks? Who can give prophecies of what's going to come in the future as God has? The answer is no one. Then let Him declare it and set an order for me. What is God doing? He's issuing, issuing a challenge, isn't He? Can you proclaim like I do? In verse 7 He says, and who can proclaim it? Then let Him declare it. And set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people, and the things that are coming and shall come, let him show these to them. And he's talking about prophecy. Who can give prophecy and have it come to fulfillment? Only God. We have numerous prophecies in the Old Testament, don't we? And we find all of them fulfilled where? In the new. Is God one he can proclaim and can deliver? Yes. Well, let's continue reading from Isaiah chapter 44, picking up in verse 8. Do not fear, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from, from that time and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? Indeed, indeed, there is no other rock. I know not one. Now, here's a question. God has always been, right? He has no beginning. He has no end. His knowledge is unsearchable, as David tells us in the Psalms, meaning His knowledge would just blow you away, and that's just a very simple way of saying it. If anyone knew there was, an, there was another God, wouldn't it be the God of the Bible? Well, notice what he says here in verse 8. He says, indeed, there is no other... Now, notice how he describes himself. Rock. No other rock. He says, I know not one. There is no other God. <coughs> also notice Isaiah 45 and verse 5. Again he says, I am the Lord and there is no other. There is no God besides me. I will gird you though you, have no, though you have not known me. Again he says, there is no God besides me. It's sometimes humorous, if it wasn't so pathetic, it'd be humorous, to hear sometimes these young men and women are teenagers who try to tell you that God doesn't exist and you listen to their arguments, and it's really clear they have been watching way too much YouTube. They haven't been looking at their science books because science tells you that, oh, God does exist. Because true science does not disagree with the Bible. The Bible does not disagree with true science. The Bible does disagree with those who simply will not believe in God no matter what you say, no matter what you show, no matter what you prove, you're not ever going to change their mind. And there's a lot of people like that in this world today. Because if there is a God, then doesn't He have to be obeyed? Yes. Let's look next at Psalm 14 and verse 1, going back to that verse. He says again, the fool has said, said in his heart, there is no God. The fool has said in his heart. You know, I think about it this way. Looking at all the things that God has done, all that He has created. You know, man still hasn't tried to, haven't found a way to tell you how the world began. I watched a movie several years ago. It's been a while now, but I remember it because it was so eye-opening to, to the viewpoints of the atheists. One man by the name of Richard Dawkins said that it would have been possible that aliens came and planted the seed of life on this earth, and that's how life began. Now, I'll be honest, it's a good thing I wasn't sitting in front of him, because it would be hard to keep a straight face, wouldn't it? Aliens? And he would also say, the point is, it's some kind of intelligent designer. Then he said, but it couldn't be God of the Bible. And the point he made very clear was, anything, any way, but the God of the Bible. Another atheist in this interview said, well, life could have been began on the back of crystals. And the interview asked him, well, where where the crystals come from? Well, we don't know. That's the thing you heard a lot. Well, we don't know. Nobody knows. Well, someone does, don't they? The world says that church, church is boring. Think about this, in Amos chapter 6 and verse 5, he says, Who sing idly to the sound of string instruments, who invent for yourselves musical instruments like 
David. Now I want you to think for a moment, why would someone, for example here in verse 5, it's clear they had invented something. That's what the text is telling us. They invented these mechanical instruments, notice, like David. When you invent something to add to worship, especially in the New Testament time here today, what are we doing? We're going against God's Word, aren't we? When someone says, well, I am bored in worship, and I hear it all the time from different people, doesn't matter what their age is, male or female, young or old, some of them say the same things. Well, church is so boring. That tells us right away there is a heart problem with that person. Not a physical heart problem. We're talking about a spiritual heart problem. Because how can someone say, and at least in my mind, this is what I think, how can you say coming and worshiping God, who you sent His Son to die for you, how can you say that is boring? Something is wrong somewhere, and it's not with God, and it's not with His Word. Let's look, if you will, we think about when man becomes bored, and let's, we'll come back to this verse in just a second. When a man becomes bored, they either invent things for themselves or they just walk away from God altogether. I mentioned this before. Too many people today are sitting at home reading their Bibles on Sunday morning and saying, isn't that enough? Well, no, the Bible tells us that's not enough. How many times does the world have to be proven wrong for the world to realize they are wrong about God? Well, let's be honest. The world will never come. The world as a whole will never come to the knowledge of obeying God. You remember before I mentioned how God is not afraid to challenge people when it comes to His existence, to anything. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 18. We see that these worldly people were proven to be wrong. 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 26 through 29. You remember this? what's happening here? They're on the mount, top of Mount Carmel, aren't they? And one prophet of God stood alone against all those prophets of Baal. Did he walk away? No. Did he cower down and say, don't hurt me? No, he didn't do any of those things. Notice, let's pick up in verse 26. So they took the bull. This is after they decided they're going to have a challenge. And they're going to set up an altar to offer up this sacrifice. And they set, it, they set it in place how they're going to do it exactly. And now in verse 26 they begin. So they took the bull which was given them and they prepared it and called the name of Baal from, the morning, from morning even till noon saying, Oh Baal, hear us. Now, they didn't begin at 1145, did they? They hollered for hours. I say hollered. There's some redneck for you. They called on Baal. They, they cried out to him from morning till noon. Now, if I'm calling someone on the phone from morning to noon, they're not answering. I'm going to pick up and realize, okay, they're not home. Did they pick up on that with Baal? That's not the case at all. Oh, Baal, hear us. But there was a notice. But there was no voice. No one answered, but that's not enough. As he goes on to say, Then they leaped, leaped about their altar, which they had made. Now notice, And so it was at noon, verse 27, that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is meditating, or he is busy, or he is on a journey, or perhaps he is sleeping and must be awakened. Why is he saying those things? Because Baal does not exist. That's what Elijah is saying. Maybe he's gone. What kind of God is that to just leave, right? Maybe he's meditating. Maybe he is busy. Maybe he's on a journey. Maybe he's asleep and you've got to wake him up. Well, they've been crying out for hours, haven't they? Verse 28 and then they cried aloud and cut themselves, as was their custom, with knives and lances, until the blood gushed out on them. Now notice verse 29. And when midday was past, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. But notice this, that there was no voice, 
No one answered. No one paid attention. Why? Because there is no God but one. Now we're going to jump ahead and look at verse 37. Elijah says, Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God, and that you may have turned, that you and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Now, if you remember, there are several things that happened between verse 29 and verse 37. One of them being he covered the altar with what? With charcoal, with kindling? No, the Bible says with water. Until it covered the altar, till it ran down and it filled up the trench around. The altar. Now, if you've ever gone camping, you know if it rains, you're going to have a hard time making a fire for the rest of the trip. You're going to have, have to have, almost have something else dry, laid aside, covered up that you can use to start it again. But Elijah knows that there's nothing that's going to stop God. A little water, what's that to God? And so he has covered it with water. Now in verse 27, or 37 rather, he, he cries out and says, O oh Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God. Well, he tells us why. He wants them to know there is only one God. Verse 38, then, they, then, then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stone and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. What just happened to those lawless people? They were just proving their God doesn't exist. And Elijah just proved the God of the Bible does. Is that, was that enough for mankind moving forward? No. That story, along with many others, should have been one to remind people that God does exist. There's only one. And you'd be foolish to follow after any other God, so-called Again, man will not believe what man simply does not want to believe. And so we have looked at government leadership, pressures of the world, but also think about this. What about Satan's devices? Satan has a lot of things in which he can use to try to discourage you, to try to bring you down, to try to do anything he can to keep you from following God. That's the last thing he wants you to do. To do. One of Satan's devices, you might say, is what I call self doubt. Satan wants, wants you to believe that you cannot resist sin. Look at James 4, verse 7, though. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Would God tell you to resist the devil if it was impossible for you to resist him? No. But Satan wants you to believe there's no way that you could overcome sin. You're too weak to overcome sin. Look at 1 Timothy 6, verses 10 and 11. But the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, <clears throat> for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Then notice verse 11. But you, O man of God, flee these things. Would he tell you to flee something if it was impossible you, possible for you to actually to flee from it? God tells us that because we can flee from sin. We can resist the devil and we can draw near to God all at the same time. Satan wants man <clears throat> to focus on the valleys of life instead of any mountaintops you may come across. The mountaintops would be with God. The valleys would be the difficulties in which you allow yourself to be straying from God. Satan wants your focus there in the valleys where you're doubting if you can be a faithful Christian as you need to be. Because he wants you to forget all about the mountaintop that you were on. And the mountaintop that's awaiting you if you will overcome and resist sin. So one of Satan's devices is self-doubt. We can look at a whole lot of them. I just picked two. First one is self-doubt. The second one is what I call doubting God. Satan would have us doubt the power of God. Those during, uh, those during this time, leading up to the flood, doubted God. And look what happened in Genesis chapter 7, verses 17 through 20. These people mocked Noah, didn't they? 
The Bible tells us He preached for them for all those years, preparing the ark, and none of them obeyed, and no doubt they mocked Him for it. But in Genesis chapter 7, verses 17 through 20, what happened that changed everything? It literally changed the earth forever. Moving forward, Genesis chapter 7, verse 17. Now the flood was on the earth forty days. The waters increased and lifted up the ark, and it rose up high above the earth. The waters prevailed and greatly increased on the earth, and the ark moved about on the surface of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth, and all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed fifteen cubits upward, and the mountains were covered. What did the Bible just tell us? God just covered the whole world in water. Before that, they were doubting Noah. You know, probably one of the last thoughts they were thinking as they were drowning, Noah was right. And there was nothing they could possibly do about it. Noah was right. Doubting God is never a smart move. Consider, if you will, with me, Job chapter 38, verses 1 through 5. Now, this is towards the latter part of Job's difficulty. And Job kind of has an attitude problem. This was his sin, if you want to say it. He committed a sin. And it appears he does because he did repent in dust and ashes, as the Bible tells us. But his attitude seemed to be the only problem. He had committed no sin prior to this. Now, in Job 38, the Lord speaks to Job. He might say he brings him back down to the earth. And the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? He's saying, Who is this who's speaking who has no idea what they're talking about? Job was having some problems, wasn't he? And I notice what God does here in verse 3. He says, Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Now those are again, there's several phrases throughout the Bible you never want to hear God say to you. That's one of them in verse 3. Prepare yourself like a man means this is not going to be enjoyable. He says, I will question you and you shall answer me. In verse 4 he says, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Where were you, Job? Can you tell me about the foundations of the earth? No, Job was nowhere to be seen, was he? Surely, he says in verse 5, he says, who, de who determined its measurement? Surely you know who stretched the line upon it. Doubting God is never a smart move. We doubt the existence of God. We can show you how God exists without ever opening up our Bibles, can't we? We can talk about design. We can talk about... Uh, cause and effect and on and on we could go without ever opening up our Bibles and show you that the world de demands a designer and it demands that there is a God. As we close this morning, we want you to be a Christian survivor who can overcome those things we've talked about. The harshness and the corruption of our leadership that's around us, our government, and their poor decision making we see so many times. To be a Christian, to be a Christian, one must be dedicated to God, not with just words, but with actions. If we want to survive the hard things we are facing this life, we cannot just say we're a Christian with our words. We have to say it with our lives as well. To be a Christian survivor, one must know how to overcome difficult times and sin. Again, can we resist Satan? James reminds us we can. Can we flee from sin and unrighteousness? Paul reminded Timothy that we can and we should. On the day of judgment, will you be a survivor? That is the question. We know the verse we talked about so many times in Revelation 2 and verse 10. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. If we are faithful unto death. If we have survived and endured these things that a Christian has to endure. This morning, as you think about these things, if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, 
if you're willing to repent of your sins and confess that Christ is the Son of God. Because if we're not willing to do those things, we'll never be a true follower of God. And then we must be baptized for our sin to be washed away. The Bible shows us that time after time in the New Testament. Our sins are washed away at baptism. And then we must remain faithful unto death. We cannot be faithful just for a short period of time. The Christian life begins at baptism and does not conclude at baptism. Also, as a Christian, we know that sometimes we make mistakes because we're human beings. We have free will. We can make choices that are good. We can make choices we think later, what was I thinking doing that? And we can ask the Lord to forgive us of those, of those things. And He will forgive us as we repent of those things. This morning, if you have any needs or concerns, you can come forward now. As we stand and sing the song that's been selected. <laughs>